Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Scriven and I am my third year at Duke University in North Carolina. I'm originally from the state of Florida and I am 21 years old. My major is Women's Studies and I'm minoring in African and African American Studies. Today I will be speaking with you all about the importance of youth involvement in human rights advocacy and I will be introducing the Women in C Student Fellowship model as a best practice that helps engage young people in getting involved with social justice and human rights advocacy issues. So I'm really excited to see so many youth here today and I hope that you all can um, take some things away from this presentation and then also let me know how you all all made it here to the CSW. <coughs> I chose this topic because of my passion for social justice and in these pictures on your left that's my grandfather on the left and he was um, that's him in a civil rights march during the 1960s in the United States when there was a lot of racial um, injustice and then on the right is me at a civil rights march in North Carolina and I was marching for women's rights as well as a lot of other civil rights issues and it really frustrates me as a young person who wants to be involved in human rights advocacy when I face a lot of barriers, not having the funds or the guidance to get more involved. And then also perceptions that people have about young people being apathetic and not caring about human rights advocacy when that's just not true at all. And so here's an overview of the model that I'll be presenting today, and it's the Women in C Fellowship model. It's incredibly pragmatic, and it's an incentive for young people. It's the reason I'm here today. So it takes, it's a local to global to local model. So it works in the community first, and it helps recruit students in North Carolina. It brings us here to the CSW, or we present to our global audience. And then we take all that we've learned here at this conference back to North Carolina to empower our communities and get them excited and on board for women's human rights. And I wanted to define youth, and the UN definition has youth from ages 15 to 24. So how many people in this room are in that group by show of hands? Cool. So it's really exciting. So together we make up 18% of the global population and in the U.S. 76 million of us are youth and no matter where you are from across the world, youth share the experiences of emerging into adulthood and facing some transitional barriers um, that help that impede us from getting involved in human rights. So I wanted to look at why youth are really important for human rights and one of the key things not only I mean, do we care and do we have innovative ideas? But also the, um, the issues um, facing the MDGs and for human rights disproportionately affect youth. So when we think about poverty um, and living in lower standards of living, it's often youth that are most impacted by these things. We're young people who are you know, just finishing our degrees, who are paying for school, who are looking for jobs, and so we're affected by the economy. And while it's mostly adults who are talking about these issues, it really impacts us most. One really important one across the world is sexual assault. And it's actually young women who are most impacted by sexual assault. So while we have adults working on the policies, it's actually one of our biggest issues as youth. And to do my research, I really wanted to hear from youth. So I tried to get youth voices when I was looking at what the barriers that we face are. So I looked at, um, in 1985, the UN declared that the International Youth Year. And since then, they brought together a lot of youth conferences and working groups on youth issues. So this brought together hundreds, thousands of youth from around the world to talk about their barriers to involvement in human rights. And so I looked at the declarations that came from these conferences, maybe some of you all were there, and I looked at um, what their challenges were and what their progressive models were to help youth be empowered so that we can work on these issues that are impacting us. And here are some of the solutions that I found echoed in a lot of these documents and I thought were very key. So this included funding sources because most, a lot of us don't have jobs and if we do, they're paying for our school or for other things that we have to um, pay for at the moment. And we needed adult support and mentorship because we needed the guidance and the know-how to get through um, some of these different terrains of involvement. We also needed NGO partnerships. We needed legitimacy. Often as youth, our legitimacy is questioned and no one really takes us seriously. Alex, the other day, when we were here at the CSW, a man came up to her and he said, oh, what are you doing here? Um, and she told, her, he, she told him, I'm here for the conference. And he said, oh, okay, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm the ambassador of wherever. And then she said, oh, okay, my name is Alex and I'm a student. And he said, cute. 
and then walked away. And so we're not just, you know, cute, you know, little people, but often if you have a name behind, you know, I'm with Women in C or I'm partnered with the Girl Scouts, then people will take you a little bit more seriously. And we want recognition for our work. We need transportation. We can't get to the CSW alone. We need guidance there. And we also want skills development and topic specific ways to get engaged. So not just clump all the youth together and say work on this issue, but we want to organize around what's important to us. And so the Women in C Student Fellowship model that I'll be presenting today was started by Beth Dagan, who's been going, who's a civil rights and human rights advocate, who's been working in this field for over 30 years in the Middle East, in Canada, and the United States. And she's been coming to the CSW for over 20 years, and she noticed that there was a lack of youth involvement and just heard people saying that we want more youth here, more youth here. So she took it upon herself to go into her community and start her own model. She invested a couple thousand dollars of her own, and in 2009, this fellowship model began, and since then, it sent 24 fellows to the CSW. And I'm gonna talk about its local to global to local framework. The fellowship starts with the local. So students in North Carolina are recruited, and once they, and they're recruited from all different schools, there's a lot of diversity with socioeconomic status, gender, um, ethnic diversity, and then they partner up to do their research projects. Now every year, the research projects correlate to the CSW annual goal. So this year, it was the Millennium Development Goals. And so each student will be working for a span of six months, six to nine months, for these research goals. And they also get a community partner. So we want to highlight the activism that's going on in North Carolina. So based upon your research topic, you partner with an NGO nonprofit in North Carolina who's working towards eradicating this issue. And then also from there, students work closely with their mentors, and they also get workshops from professional speaking coaches and from how to network with people and just how to be a human rights advocate. And they have a lot of preparation. One of our biggest events is a local North Carolina dinner where we speak to audiences of 200 people or more about our topic. So we get the chance to present before we come to the CSW. And this year, we were really lucky to have Ellie Smeal, who is the president of the Feminist Majority, join us for our panel dinner in North Carolina. Then we get to come to the local, which is really exciting for us because who never really imagined ourselves getting to come into this position to present to you all and the CSW brings an audience of six to 8,000 people, over 190 countries, and we get to introduce the best practices from our local communities here to the global community. And we also get to go to everyone's different events and learn about these issues and how they're being solved in different locations. Then we have the global to local. So when we return back to North Carolina for being here at the CSW, we complete research papers and we compile all the data. Every night we're blogging and discussing what we've learned here at CSW and we bring this back to the North Carolina community to get people excited and to get them on board. We do radios, we do TV shows, we go into our schools and organize events there and we tell them about what we're learning and what's going on globally. So it's really important for us to learn from you all, the global audience, so we can take this back to North Carolina, especially now because in our state there's a lot of um, not progress with the women's human rights. And so it's really important to get people on board. And one of the really key things about this model is our alumni association. When students complete this program, they join the alumni association. And I was able to get a lot of feedback from the fellows who had a really great experience with Women NC and who it's impacted, it's impacted their lives greatly. And so one of the fellows from 2012 says that before being enrolled in Women NC's fellowship, she, as a science major, she always thought about science for science. And now I'm thinking about science for human rights. And so it's really important as an organization who wants to get young people involved and engaged with women's human rights that we have this transformation and attitude and perspective after coming to the CSW. And these are some of the things I highlighted. The Alumni Association and their involvement in the community for women's human rights really goes on and on, but these were some of the things that came up for me. And so we have alumni who go on to be university coordinators for violence and prevention on their student, on their campuses. They go for women's campaign funds, um, Afghan women's writing project, 
Rape Crisis Center, Peace Corps in Indonesia, and then also one is on the um, Google Community Partnership Program for Education to get more women involved in STEM. So really what we are learning here is impacting our career choices and the research that we do following this experience. And I broke up some of the um, key key pieces of feedback into two categories. So the first one is self-efficacy and leadership development. Students who complete the program report being more confident, having more public speaking skills, knowing how to network, um, and just stronger organization, research, advocacy skills. Also, another key thing is a commitment to women's human rights issues. And so, as I mentioned, they go on to work for these issues and get involved in nonprofits to continue on the legacy of what's going on here at the CSW. Um, one of our fellows was featured in Miss Magazine. We have fellows who work for Feminist Majority. And the list just goes on and on. So it really transforms their vision. And one fellow said it gives them the feminist fabric of life. And so I really wanted to leave you all with some ways to support this student fellowship model. And I really believe that it is adaptable and can work in so many different communities and bring us all back to the CSW together. So it is important to share this student fellowship model. If you are wondering how to get more youth involved, or you want to be more involved yourself, um, you can take this model back to your community and tweak it for ways that would work best for you. Um, and then serve as a community partner. If you do have models like this in your community, find out how you can be a mentor and how your organization can contribute and share your best practices. And then also donations are always really important, especially from foundations, because as it was mentioned, a lot of organizations will fund high school and middle school programs, but when it comes to the university level, there is a lack of funding for um, college students who want to be involved. And then also university partnership is important, and so we're all working to get our universities to sponsor a fellow each year for this program. And then also just believe in youth, believe in ourselves, yourselves. We really have the power to transform the world, and we can do this. And so I now want to introduce you to one of our fellows from 2010, Annie Clark. And Annie Clark really embodies the local to global model. Three years ago, she was here presenting her research on sexual assault on college campuses at the UN. And since then, she's gone on to be declared one of the nation's most influential people on college campuses alongside our president, Barack Obama. And today, she's going to share what she's been up to since completing the Women C Student Fellowship model. Give them one more hand. That was absolutely incredible. Thanks. So I'm going to kind of share my personal story briefly and sort of a, a lot of these fellows have talked about education, violence, gender-based violence, and I'm going to bring that together in a tangible way. So this is how I got involved with the program. In 2007 at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, where two of these students were, um, I was raped. And when I went to the university to ask for support and report my um, attack, I was given a really victim-blaming response. And so I worked in North Carolina. I worked on policy to make sure that this didn't happen to other women. So I applied for this fellowship and got deeply interested not just in my university's policy, but in United States policy. So I presented on U.S. Um, violence prevention and policy in higher education. Came to the UN, had an amazing time, left my heart here, left my coat here, um, and just, you know, amazing. And so after my presentation, um, a fellow came up to me and said, I'm in high school. This stuff is going at my, on at my high school. What can I do? And this was three years ago. Fast forward a little bit. I graduate, do that job thing, which is kind of scary, and I'm working at the University of Oregon. Students start to reach out to me because of my work at UNC on violence prevention. These students say, the policies you did in North Carolina were great, but I know we can do more. This is happening nationally. So we start to look into what we can do. And we had worked with the administration. We had worked for greater policies. We had worked with our local government. But there still wasn't tangible change. So in 2013, um, five other women and I filed um, one of the first Title IX and Clery Act complaints against the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with the U.S. Department of Education. I'm 24. We learned how to do this, we wrote these complaints, we learned the law, and we did media. And as soon as this happened, it exploded. So locally we're working in North Carolina, globally I'm at the U.N., and then nationally we have all of these people reaching out to us. 
and we realized this was not just one issue on one college campus, but it was endemic, and not just you know in the United States, but in the world. Since then, um, our story was front page New York Times News, and we have been working not only with the White House on the Federal Task Force, but with Singapore, Canada, um, some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Australia using CEDAW, actually, as a way to end gender-based violence in education. Because how can we close this gender gap if we can't even get through school safely? So anyway, um, that is a little bit about what I'm doing right now. And wanted to share that with you all if anybody's interested or taking questions. I know that was brief. And um, yeah. Thank you to Annie and our five fantastic fellows. And so we're already a bit late, so we're going to speed this up a bit. But we will be available for questions after out in the hallway because we want to respect the time for the people that are coming in after us to do their panel. So now we're going to hear from one of our mentors because as Sarah so eloquently stated, the, the fellows, the youth need mentoring. They need a framework to be introduced to the social activism scene. And so we do that through mentors that work with our organization. And we're going to speak to one of our mentors right now, Young Hee. Overly. Good morning. Uh, so as you can see, um, I am one of the what 0.4 percent <laughs> women in the United States uh, who studied computer engineering and has successful 30-year career at IBM. I am ready to start my second career. Uh, in women's rights internationally, and so I am in grad school right now. Um, when Beth, uh, for obvious reason, asked if I can work with Alex on women in STEM, I thought, sure, I think I know a thing or two about it that I can share with Alex. I'd be happy to do that. And I knew that I'd have a lot of fun because I knew I'd be working with a lot of young, interesting, smart people. But what I did not know is how much I will learn from them. Because having volunteered for U.S. National Committee for UN Women, I have been focusing on the global level. So ask me any stats at global level, I could tell you. But I didn't know about locally. And through them, I learned about local issues as well as local best practices. And Alex really got me excited about the Purpose Institute. I think I may actually go volunteer for them. Um, and then on top of that, at personal level, as Alex and I conversed about the influence our parents had on us, I realized it was my mom from rural Korea when it was a third world country uh, with four years of education, four years, not even total primary education, who thought all her children, including her girls, were going to get educated as far as they can. And I have to say, again, I'm 53 in grad school. So I think she has succeeded. <laughs> so it was my mom who did that. However, it was my dad, my, whom I thought was male chauvinist dad, Confucius male chauvinist dad, <laughs> thought her girls were really good in math. And the her girls should become computer engineers. And I must say, both I and my younger sister are computer engineers. And interestingly, my brother is a lawyer. <laughs> and he was good in math, too. So it made me realize the influence, little remarks, like, you are good in math, so go to become a computer engineer. And whether it's from a women role model or male role model, it doesn't matter. Say something give us support. That's what I realized. So I am having fun working with them. I learned a lot. And most importantly, I'm very hopeful for the future because of them, Annie and them. So that's what I have to say. So thank you, Beth, for the opportunity. Thank you, Annie. And now, last but not least, um, well, before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge Kim Williams Caper. I don't know where she is. She's been keeping us straight with the receipts and the money, keeping us honest. You know how that is. It's hard, New York. 
There's an H&M on every corner. Um, so thank you, Kim, for, um, she's been with the board for a while, so she's here with us as well. And now we'll hear from Beth Dagan, who is the founder and president of the organization, about where we are and why it's so important to engage you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to take your time. I will open the floor for question and answer. I am sure after this amazing presentation, mm -hmm. uh, you might have discussion with our fellows. The only thing that I like to share with you is the reason that I started this organization. Coming to the CSW meetings every year, and for more than 20 years since Beijing, I just felt that there was a missing link with whatever we do locally, the good practices that we have, even in South, in North Carolina, that people say, wow, North Carolina, women's human rights. Yes, there are a, a lot of good practices happening in North Carolina, and many, many nonprofits, they are working on women's human rights and women's issues. And then, I am here at CSW and I see all this information and going back home by myself. And for one week I was just mute. My husband just kept asking me, why are you so quiet? Because I said, this is so much information. I don't, want, I, I don't know how can I relay these messages to my local community. And then coming here every year to see these familiar faces, we are getting older and older, and I feel like, well, I think we need to turn the torch to the next generation. So putting all these ideas together, I go in 2009, I go back home, and I uh, have a, like a tea meeting with some of my friends who were interested in women's human rights issues. And I said, you know what? I am just thinking of creating just the ad hoc committee called North Carolina Committee for CSW and CEDA. And they said, oh, so then what you are going to do? I said, I think we have to do our best to take a group of students to CSW. We need to take them there. That's an excellent opportunity for them to bring the global education to our community. Mm -hmm. And then we started it. We were not even registered. The first year, without looking for money, without looking for paid staff, we just rely on our volunteer work and our personal fund, and we started the project. And since then, this project has been going on. The organization has been established. Still, uh, we haven't been able to receive any grant, any fund from any place. We are just, we have a list of like 200 local donors that they write like $50, $100 check to the organization. The expenses of each student to be enrolled because they stay here in uh, uh, New York for one week is around three thousand dollars and then bringing five six students depends on our budget it's not easy to raise funds I have been really working for last five years full time to run the organization we have a board of 12 and 50 volunteers and we are just working on it we are building it every year anyway so if you have any question, if you want to take the model back home, I am available to answer your question afterward. My cards are here. If you want to email me, you are more than welcome. And the presentation and the pa research papers of these fellows will be posted on our website. And you have access to all the research papers for last five years from our fellows on our website. And if you have any question, then you know, I'm more than happy to answer your question. And I would like also to recognize our panel moderator, Anjabin Ashraf from NC State. She's a PhD student. She had a mentorship role for our fellows this year, and she has been a volunteer with Women NC. Thank you, Anjabin, Thank you. for a wonderful time. Wow, thank you, Beth. We have about five minutes, so I think we take one or two questions. Just one, one, thank you. And also, I would like to thank Lynn, our photographer, volunteer photographer, who covers our events every year. She comes from California, but you know, women networking magic works. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hey, yo, we have thank you. Madrid. You're welcome. Hey, we are from Madrid, Spain, and we would like to know 
Uh, what do you think? Um, how can we work in human rights from university? That's okay. our question. Great. So did everyone hear that question? They are attending from Spain, Madrid, and they would like to know how can you work from the university level for human rights? So whoever, whichever one of our fellows wants to take that. So I think that what Andy Clark did is a really good starting point. And so if you notice issues on your campus, you can start working on them and organizing people who care about these issues. And so I know that's how my involvement started. Even before Women in C, I was working on campus issues and organizing around those. And then also look into your community and see what kind of, um, what kind of programs they have there. And then also a big thing is like for the student demand. So talk to the people on your campus about funding these different opportunities and see how they can fund you if you have a really great idea to maybe go to a conference somewhere or with your group to share what you all really care about. Also, just as a quick aside, a lot of the UN missions have appropriated some funds for youth kind of activities and human rights. Um, so by contacting your, your mission at the United Nations, there's a possibility that they will be more clued into even national efforts in Spain, for instance, um, where youth are being involved in human rights. So I would definitely use them as a starting point as well. Uh, I realize students um, come from all different states, you know, to, at, at the universities and maybe don't pay attention to local government, but I'm in your particular hardship case in North Carolina, I wonder if you, uh, because let's face it, everything's on the line there. Reproductive rights from, I mean, health, everything. If, is there anything you do direct, or do you, is there anything that you do uh, directly with uh, your legislators or the governor? Yeah, so the question is that do we work directly with our legislators in lobbying for, um, if you're not familiar with what's happening in North Carolina, there's really been this really conservative legislature that's come in and has repealed and introduced legislation that has taken us back 100 years in relation to minorities, whether it's gender or ethnicity, or sexual orientation. So, one of the fellows. <laughs> well, I was just going to mention um, the moral march that we did that I was... And Women in C, we, they actually took a group there, and so a lot of organizations did the Moral March, which was connected to the Moral Mondays, where every Monday they were protesting for the various civil rights infractions in North Carolina. And so that was one way that we've been participating. And also, we are the member of this umbrella organization, North Carolina Women United. We work on advocacy work by approaching our legislators and going to Women's Advocacy Day to the legislation in North Carolina. Yes, the advocacy work is another aspect of our work. Okay, great. Thank you. And we're going to take one more question, and then we are going to respect our next presenters uh, by moving out into the hallway where we will all be available for questions. Hello everyone, I am Shapnam from Afghanistan. Uh, during uh, my this visit to United States, it is, uh, I got lots of experience. Uh, just, uh, I have a question, a question raised in my mind during this uh, week. Uh, I know that the reason of uh, violence and discrimination in these things are all uh, right, like country like Afghanistan, maybe it is, or any other countries, or poverty, education, in these things. But one thing that I noticed during my visit that in developed country, the violence and discrimination is also developed. And um, I don't know exactly the causes. I want to know the cause of this. Uh, because um, people are now thinking of different ways how to create violence or how to discriminate. Uh, so that is why I want to know the exact causes in this kind of country where the poverty is less reduced and also the education level is high. So what are the exact causes of the violence here? Thank you. Well, I think it's a pretty tall order to say this is the exact cause of violence in the U.S., let alone around the world. So I don't know that I have a concrete answer that I can give you. But I would say that despite the fact as, as Max pointed out, it's a very complicated issue and there are many different causes. But you do make a great point that here in the U.S., a lot of those issues that we may recognize on an international level as being correlated 
with violence against women are not as prevalent in the U.S. as they are the, are the places, which is why specifically um, I think it's important that we do look at relational norms that are promoted within society, because even in countries where poverty may be greatly reduced, or some of those other factors that she mentioned, we're still seeing this violence against women. And as Max pointed out, it has to do with inequality, which is really an imbalance of power, which when you come down to it, has to do with how we relate to one another, which is why I really wanted to focus on relational norms in my research, because I think a lot of the problems, and it's not as simple as this, so I would, I would never be so precocious as to say there is one simple solution, but I do think we can look at the fact of relational dynamics and how that plays a role in equality, inequality between men and women, inequality in interpersonal relationships, and even inequality across the world between countries. And so I think it is important that we look at how we consider relationships and how those dynamics work between people and nations.